Dinosaurs, the creatures that time itself has forgotten. But still to this day, the dinosaurs and other prehistoric life have brought wonder and joy to all across the globe for many years. And now with this new five episode series, that wonder shall continue on. Our story begins here, in the late Devonian. The Earth has seen many aquatic animals come and go, but now it is the age of fish. This is Cladosolachi, the ultimate ocean predator, able to catch even the fastest of fish. But it seems that today, the hunter has become the hunted. This is Dunkleosteus, the apex predator of the deep, built to turn prehistoric sharks such as Cladoslachi into chum, with massive blades for teeth. Dunkleosteus was both the most largest and widespread animal of its time, with as many as 10 different species ranging from the United States, Europe and Africa. Being able to grow up to lengths of 20 feet, Dunkleosteus would be able to take down other giant placoderm fish such as the filter-feeding Titanonychthes. Placoderms are an extinct clade of prehistoric fish known from fossils which lived from the Silurian to the Devonian. Dunkleosteus and Titanonychthes are the largest species of this group. Placoderms like Dunkleosteus had massive armoured plates that covered their head and thorax, while the rest of their bodies were left unprotected, which would be an extreme disadvantage in combat, but this was made up for its teeth-like blades which were connected to the rest of its armour, and it was Dunkleosteus who could shut its mouth faster than you could blink, making it a truly ferocious predator of the deep. Being a carnivore, the diet of Dunkleosteus mainly consisted of sharks, amphibians, and it would occasionally practice cannibalism. While life underwater stays to its usual, on land, a new evolutionary path is undertaking its humble beginnings, ready to change the course of life on Earth forever. Early amphibians like Hynopton have been able to thrive on the land since most of their natural predators can't reach them from the water's edge. Coming to the water's edge can be a death sentence, but this female Hynopton must take on the risk in order to lay her eggs. Amphibian eggs are soft and must be laid underwater, where Hynopton are most vulnerable. Her splashing has attracted unwanted attention from a Cladosolachi. Just in time. Unsuccessful with her hunt, 
the Clado Salachi returns to her underwater home. Amphibians made their first steps onto land in the Middle Devonian, and over time they left their fins and flippers behind and traded them for arms and legs, and their gills for lungs. These are all traits that would stay for all future land animals. For an early amphibian, Hynopatan was rather large compared to modern day amphibians, being able to reach lengths of up to 1.5 meters long. Hynopatan and its relatives, Ichthyostega and Acanthostega, were some of the first vertebrates to ever step foot on land. Underwater, the Dunkleosteus is patrolling her territory. A rival has appeared from the depths. He is younger, but no less stronger. The female manages to use her advantage of size to scare off the male. She may have been able to brush off this encounter, but she has no idea what is about to come. The late Devonian was evolution's playground as the land became home to new flora and fauna, including one of the first trees, Archaeopteris. And for the land animals, this would provide food and shelter, but for the aquatic animals, the trees would take too much oxygen. These oxygen shortages would be the cause of a change in climate and the water growing colder, which would be the death of tropical fish, including even the almighty Dunkleosteus. On the shoreline, a titan, an apex predator, finds herself here washed up, dying. But with the temporary demise of giant ocean predators such as Dunkleosteus, the land animals would be left to rise the ranks through the Carboniferous and the Permian. We have now travelled to the early Permian, a time when the land animals grew much larger than their amphibious ancestors. A solitary Adaphosaurus searches for vegetation in this dry, unforgiving desert. But whenever alone, you're always vulnerable to predators. Watching from the bushes is a male Dimetrodon. Just like the Adaphosaurus, he too is a synapsid, a group of animals that is more closely related to mammals than true reptiles. Using its long claws, the Adaphosaurus is able to dig up the ground and eat the nutritious roots underneath. Quickly, he goes in for the kill. He has missed his chance to bite the Adaphosaurus neck, and now there is a weak spot in his plan. The Adaphosaurus manages to ward off the Dimetrodon with a threatening display. Creatures such as Dimetrodon and Adaphosaurus are a part of two major groups, the Synapsids, and the other being Sauropsids, which include the dinosaurs, reptiles and birds, while Synapsids are mammals and anything related to them. It may be hard to believe that reptile-looking Dimetrodon and Adaphosaurus are more closely related to mammals than reptiles, but there are a few defining features that make them related to mammals. One of these defining features are the shape of their skulls, which include the temporal fenestra and an opening lower than the roof of the skull behind each of the eyes. Dimetrodon and other proto-mammals are indeed early signs of the mammals that will come millions of years later. A young Dimetrodon has gone exploring, unaware of the danger nearby. Out of desperation for a meal, 
the Demetrodon has had no choice but to eat another one of his kind. Similar to Dunkleosteus, Demetrodon was most likely a cannibal if the opportunity ever presented itself. Demetrodon would be able to kill its prey in mere seconds with its robust head filled with incisor-like teeth used for gripping onto its prey and canines to stab, as well as curved rear teeth for shearing through flesh and a hook-like notch on the roof of the mouth which could pin down struggling prey. But not only was Demetrodon a killer, it was also a show-off, using its brightly coloured sail on the top of its back for sexual display. Other synapsids of this time have also used this feature to its advantage. After eating his fill, the Demetrodon decides to wash it down by drinking at a nearby lake. A Diplocolus has spotted the Demetrodon. <laughs> Diplocolus had a very unique looking head, sort of shaped like a boomerang. Normally, Demetrodon would see this amphibian as an easy meal, but in this circumstance, there is a temporary truce. Peace at the lake. After the two have quenched their thirsts, they go their separate ways. Welcome to the Middle Permian, during a time when Russia was part submerged underwater, creating many swamps and wetlands. And it is in these swamps where a disgusting beast emerges. This is Estamanosuchus, the largest animal in this ecosystem. But have no fear, Estamanosuchus was primarily a herbivore that fed upon the wetland shrubs that surrounded its habitat. Estamanosuchus is a very unique looking species of Pharapsid. It possessed several antlers on the top of its head that look almost like those of a modern day moose. However, its body appearance and behavior was probably more like a hippopotamus. Estamanosuchus could reach a length of more than 3 meters and 226 kilograms in weight. The reason for this would be that Estamanosuchus didn't have any predators that could reach its full size. This Estamanosuchus in particular is a bull. He is fully grown and the largest of his kind in the area. Yet he has been left with the duty of looking after a clutch of free eggs. In the animal kingdom, it is mostly the females who take care of the young, but in some circumstances, including this one, it is the males who do it instead. He must take good care of these eggs as there are always egg thieves who lurk nearby, waiting for their opportunity to strike. But when hunger hits, the male must leave his eggs to go find food. Before he does, the Estamanosuchus shelters his eggs with vegetation, hiding them from potential scavengers. Afterwards, he temporarily leaves his eggs so he can go hunting. This is Eotitanosuchus, a close relative of the Gorgonopsids and a regular scavenger who seems to have found herself a banquet. Meanwhile, an amphibian known as Konzukovia is fishing. 
Konzu Kovia could reach a length of three metres when fully grown, and could have potentially preyed upon younger Estamanosuchus, but this Konzu Kovia in particular is only a juvenile. Instead, primitive sharks such as Dania Decora are on the menu. Peering through the water, she fixes on her unwary victim. Success! But the amphibian's feast is cut short when the bull Estamenosuchus arrives. Even though Estamenosuchus would prefer to feed upon the wetland shrubs, it would never pass up the occasional omnivorous diet. After stealing the Konzukovia's catch, the Estamanosuchus returns to his nest, unaware that someone has already gotten there first. Caught in the act by the angered bull, the Eo Titanosuchus decides to stand her ground, refusing to leave the nest. But the Estamanosuchus has other plans. <laughs> Out of the clutch of three eggs, only one wasn't eaten by the egg thief. With only one egg left, the Estamanosuchus will protect it with his life. We have reached the late Permian, a time where the most devastating mass extinction will soon occur. A young male Dinogorgon searches for a place to quench his thirst, but on this dying planet, that may be a struggle for him. Dinogorgon is a species of Gorgonopsid, which belongs to the group Therapsids, more derived Synapsids. For Gorgonopsid standards, Dinogorgon is rather small, especially compared to the more famous Inostrancevia, but a pack of Dinogorgon could definitely take down the herbivorous Pereosaurus. Dinogorgon most likely used its long legs to pounce onto its prey and stab them with their sharp, saber-like teeth. Down by the local watering hole, a Procynosuchus relaxes by the shore. Procynosuchus is indeed a strange one, as it was a semi-aquatic early cynodont and a relative of both reptiles and mammals. And while this animal is unique, to say the least, its semi-aquatic lifestyle has proven plentiful. He returns to the shore with his catch, ready to feast upon it. Suddenly, the little Cynodon's feast has been interrupted by the arrival of the Dinogorgon. But it doesn't take long for the Dinogorgon to be approached by the angered Procynosuchus.
After scaring off the Dinogorgon, the Procyanosuchus returns to his meal. Nearby, signs of an upcoming mass extinction are becoming more noticeable. Nicknamed the Great Dying, the Permian extinction is thought to have been triggered by extreme volcanic eruptions which resulted in dramatic environmental changes such as toxic greenhouse gases and ocean acidification, causing 95% of all life, both terrestrial and aquatic, to die out. The Great Dying has reached its peak, and in these harsh conditions, the young Dinogorgon desperately searches for food. The dead corpse of a fallen Pereasaurus will hopefully come as a helpful aid in his survival. It seems that the smell of flesh has attracted a rival. But the young male won't give his meal up all that easily. A fight shall ensue. Next episode, we shall travel to the late Triassic to witness the rise of a new species, the dinosaurs.